Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Matthews. My um, dominant name is Sianza. And I'm going to talk today about the gratification, the danger, and the escape. This is a, a concept that comes up quite a bit in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about some of it from uh, Samir Nikaya. He does talk about this with uh, Majjhima Nikaya. So there are different suttas that talk about the, the gratification and danger in the escape. And we'll get into what that means and um, maybe what some of what the Buddha meant by it. But the first thing I'd like to do is just read this short sutta. This is Samhita Nikaya 1252. At Savati, bhikkhus, when one dwells con contemplating gratification in things that can be clung to, craving increases. With craving is condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging is condition, existence. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Suppose because a great bonfire was burning consuming 10, 20, 30, or 40 loads of wood, and a man would cast dry grass, dry cow dung, and dry wood into it from time to time. Thus, sustained by that material, fueled by it, that great bonfire would burn for a very long time. So too, when one lives contemplating gratification in things that can be clung to, craving increases, such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Because when one dwells contemplating danger in things that can be clung to, craving ceases. With the cessation of craving comes cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of existence, cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, displeasure, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Suppose because a great bonfire was burning, consuming 10, 20, 30, or 40 loads of wood, and a man would not cast dry grass, dry cow dung, or dry wood into it from time to time. Thus, when the former supply of fuel is exhausted, that great bonfire not being fed with any more fuel, lacking sustenance, would be extinguished. So too, when one lives contemplating danger in things that can be clung to, Craving ceases, and such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. So this is a relatively short, as I said, it's a short sutta. There are a few uh, that follow this one with different similes. Um, some pretty good information if you're ever interested. But this one is enough to begin to just talk about this idea of the gratification, the danger, and the escape. So in this sutta, the Buddha is claiming that contemplating and indulging in craving leads to increased craving. Craving leads to suffering and cessation of craving leads to cessation of suffering. That's all, if you're familiar with Buddhism, relatively straightforward stuff. Um, that's kind of the goal, that if we can stop piling wood onto the bonfire, then we can stop feeding it um, by not feeding, craving, we can lead the way toward the cessation. We can extinguish our own flames. But I'd like to kind of pick this apart a little bit more. So by gratification, I think he intends to say, as I was saying in the last slide, contemplating and indulging in craving. So that's whenever we have contact with sensory objects in the world, uh, how we regard those things is what leads to their increase or decrease. 
And the Buddha is saying that craving doesn't really get smaller if we're giving it more attention. If we're regarding it as important and personal and meaningful, uh, craving will increase. It feeds the bonfire. So if you're practicing meditation or you're, you're going through your life and um, just kind of following your craving, you know, I want this, I don't want that, this is what I like, this is what I don't like, um, then craving increases, but how that manifests itself is through the hindrances. So five hindrances are the things that are coming up all the time. We get to see them very clearly in meditation because we sit down and we we really look closely at those, but they're happening all the time. We just don't notice them very much. And the more we increase and feed that bonfire, the, the more hindrances will get stronger. And part of the problem is that when we do that, we feel like we're the owner of those things, that they mean something. Um, that it's us, that this craving matters to that. By its nature, craving is rooted in the sense of a self. And this just makes it more. And this is why with meditation, we don't just follow whichever whim or feeling or thought comes to mind. The idea is, especially at first with meditation, to come back to a wholesome object that doesn't increase craving, doesn't make it bigger, does it make it worse? Um, and then eventually you can practice the type of meditation that's more observation. But at first you have to have really keen mind, it's really strong observation so that you're not feeding it, you're not increasing. And the truth of it is that these things are arising and passing away without your influence without you really being involved, we're just making it personal as we look at and interact with the world. So the next part that the Buddha claims is that craving leads to suffering. And this to me seems self-evident because you can observe it in meditation. It's something that you can observe in real life too but I think it's more difficult to understand how just going through life, um, doing things that may seem on the surface, wholesome, unharmful, like, you know, I was talking a couple of weeks ago about um, creating and feeding the de desire in myself for Taco Bell. And it's a bit of a problem because if you start feeding that and feeding it, eventually you might not have that food. Um, and then you'll be basically spoiled by that craving. You'll have a desire for it and you won't be able to get it. And that's on a small scale, on a larger scale, it's the idea that within life, you know, I'm satisfying myself if I do that behavior. Um, just makes my sense of self and desire stronger. And eventually, ultimately, the idea is that sense of self uh, doesn't truly exist. It's just a collection of things that are temporary. So I'm putting my, my feeling, my desire into something that is a temporary, um, a temporary thought, uh, a temporary situation that's come about as a result of external conditions. And it's dependent on external conditions. So if those are not there, if those are not met, that's when suffering happens. And that's the basic idea. Uh, with why craving leads to suffering. Got off track with my thoughts. But a lot of it also has to do with habit energy. Um, you know, as we engage in behaviors in the world, as we're interacting with the world, uh, we tend to continue to see and expect the same things whenever that happens. If we're doing things that are increasing craving, um, things that are, as the Buddha would say, unwholesome in that circumstance, then uh, we can expect an unfavorable result. Uh, but thankfully, we can use that in a positive way. 
So habit energy isn't necessarily just bad, it's just the way that things work. Uh, for example, if I take um, something I really like to do is to run. I like exercising in the mornings. Um, so every day I run, maybe not every day, five to seven days a week I run. Um, and I can base that on craving. I can base it on desire for the feeling of release and anxiety management and you know happiness that running brings, um, managing my calorie intake so that I can be beautiful or something like that. Um, or I can just base it on my practice, which is what I try more and more to do. Uh, not basing it on things that are uh, leading toward a negative result, but more on um, mindfulness of my feet and my body as I move, um, focusing on loving kindness as I run, focusing on the breath as it moves in and out of the body. And this is also stress relief and it also builds habit energy, but it does it in a way that I can do those things at any time. But when I lose the ability to run, because I will someday, then I've built it into a way that I can benefit without the running itself. Uh, the habit energy can continue. It's a training tool. But the most important part and the idea of that uh, comparison is you can engage with anything in your life in a wholesome or an unwholesome way. Uh, not in a, I'm not, uh, and if you're not familiar with more, uh, wholesome and unwholesome, it's not really a moral determine, determination. It's more of um, just leading to a result that's better or worse. So uh, the way you're regarding the stimulus is what determines how the future arises. And the Buddha also makes the claim that the cessation of craving leads to the cessation of suffering. This is something you can see as well through practice. Um, to me, it's self-evident because I've seen it in action with meditation. If you are bringing your attention to an object skillfully, if you're staying with your meditation object without um, pushing on it or, or grabbing at it or pushing something away without craving, not putting craving into your meditation, then um, the fire is no longer fed. That's how the bonfire goes out. Sometimes that takes a long time. Sometimes it takes a little time. Um, but that's why the Buddha would say things like you can follow the breath all the way to the end. Um, some of these meditation objects, you know, you, you get experience with them and an affinity for them. And you can just pull them up on their own without you doing anything. They're just there. Uh, they do come about as a result of external conditions. So you're intending to make them come up and they come up. Um, but the practice itself, then if you're interacting with it without grabbing at it and pushing things away without craving, um, it leads to a lessening of craving. So over time, when hindrances come up, and I'll talk more about the hindrances, if your meditation is effective, then Hindrances will come up, but they won't be as impactful. They won't mean as much to you because craving is based on me and mine and I and what I want and what I don't want. This is a little bit of how the path works, you know, the Buddhist path, where you're not getting anything. There's a lot of references, and uh, we'll see it in our chanting, about how there's no extinction, there's no path, there's nothing to be attained, you're not going somewhere, you're not getting anything, because if you think about a bonfire, the absence of that fire isn't something. It just is not there anymore. 
you know, we can put all kinds of words on the lack of something, but really that's just making another something. But this is how the, the hindrances work. And these are the hindrances, if you're not familiar, I'm sure you will be if you meditate and you look at them in this way, but it's just a way of classifying mental phenomena, bothersome things that come up, sensual craving, anger, ill will, hostility, whatever you call it, sloth and torpor, restlessness, worry, agitation, and doubt. Doubt can take a few different forms. Sometimes it's a doubt whether you're doing the right meditation. Is this working? Am I sitting here with my meditation object correctly? Um, sometimes it's doubt in the teaching itself or a teacher. But this all sounds nice in theory. Um, but I think you should know that it's not just a theoretical thing that you'll sit during meditation, if you do it right long enough, you'll get some kind of, you know, spontaneous magical result. This is something where if you're sharpening your powers of observation and your understanding of mental phenomena, then you will begin to see what the Buddha teaches as far as the arising and passing away of objects within the mind, objects meaning hindrances, objects sometimes meaning meditation objects. Everything is based on the idea of um, impermanence. So all of these things that are arising and passing away are impermanent. So you can observe it. I remember once during a, a meditation retreat, I was on I think day five or six, and it was a 10 day retreat. And I often will struggle with drowsiness, sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor are like the drowsy feeling that you get. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's mental, sometimes it's both. For me, it tends to manifest as both. But it was really a powerful sensation. Um, sometimes you do need sleep, of course. Sometimes you can be physically tired and that can impact your meditation. But I didn't have a specific reason for these. Um, the meditation retreat was staying up until 10 or 10 30 or later, getting up at I think 4 30. So not as much sleep as maybe I was accustomed to, but not enough where I should not be able to stay away from I'm sitting in a chair. So I engaged with sloth and torpor in the way that I was taught. Um, don't push it away. Note, note that it comes up. My head was bobbing. I was so tired. Um, so note that it was there, but bring back mindfulness. Go back to my meditation object and move back to that. At the time, it was equanimity, which is a difficult one because for me, it's a little bit, it's a very subdued meditation object. But um, what happened and why I'm bringing this up is that eventually I saw through it. I got through it. It came up and it came up and came up. And eventually it wore itself out. And I got through the other side in such a way that, of course, I still experience drowsiness. I still experience sloth and torpor, right? But I saw for myself with this specific hindrance that it's impermanent. It doesn't have to affect me. And so in the future, if I'm meditating here, then that moment is so clear because it was personal experience and personal understanding of how the hindrances arise and pass away. That it wasn't some great moment of enlightenment, but it was my own awakening to that. And you can do this with all of the meditation objects. If they arise and you don't interact with them, that's fine. It's something that arose. You can move back to your object of meditation. Could be your breath, whatever you're using. And just keep doing that. You don't have to do anything different. You can um, keep from pushing it away. You can keep from grabbing at something. Um, but you can 
in a permanent sense, it can weaken the hindrances. This isn't just theory and the next lifetime you're going to be able to do these things or or that you know there there are moments where there's a sudden awakening and understanding but i think a lot of times it takes a form of just coming to understand that the buddha was right in the same way that if you look at a picture of the grand canyon uh, that's one thing but seeing the grand canyon for yourself is a different thing it's the same but it's also not so maybe the hindrances work that way, but I always like to bring up, so what, what's the point? Um, the point is not to feel good, not to feel like the hindrances are under control because we could practice in such a way that we just keep it down, you know? Practice when you feel bad enough that you feel good. Um, but, and that is a valid thing to do. It's good to feel good, but there's more to it than that. The hindrances, as they arise and pass away, are based on um, previous problems that have come up, previous transgressions or unwholesome acts or things like that. Sometimes they're rooted from a long time ago. But if you take responsibility for the hindrance, um, allow it to pass away, and then it becomes weakened, it doesn't come up as much, then you can start to see reality more clearly. And the Buddha talked about um, these things are, are like a film or a lens over your, your vision of reality. If you can see through those, then you can get to a point, as I said, where you can no longer be affected by that. So one uh, step in this is disenchantment. Disenchantment is feeling less enchanted as you would imagine. Um, enchanted by the nature of what composes ourself. So that's our material form, our feelings, our perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. As those things arise moment to moment, then they contain an element of ourselves because we have personality of you and we have um, desires and we have wants and we have fears. Um, so as the six senses create our experience of the world, then in the moment that we've even begun to understand what an object is or what or, you know, for example, a pen, knowing what a pen is, or that this is a book, we've already put our perception of that thing into it. And we'll come along with that perception, along comes the idea that I like it, or I don't like it, or have some um, feeling about it, some thought about it. But eventually disenchantment is a point where you can look at something a perception that you get, um, a sensation that comes in, or a thought during meditation, you know, a feeling, and not be affected by that. Um, disenchantment is when that sloth and torpor, that drowsiness that I was feeling, was weakened a little bit, no longer casting a spell over me. That's disenchantment. But it's not completely letting go. It's close. It feels like it, but but it's still there. If you're practicing wisely, then disenchantment dispassion, as I'll talk about, becoming less involved with the world doesn't lead to a sense of negativity either. It sounds sometimes like, especially I remember when I practiced, when I, I was alone practicing in the beginning for a few years in Buddhism, I would, um, this was before YouTube, I would look things up on buddhanet.net, I think is what it was. It was one of the only places I could find really like Buddhist scripture like 
uh, Samyutta Nikaya, things like that. So uh, I didn't understand at that time that, you know, meditation if done correctly, it doesn't just produce a sense of blankness and disconnectedness and non-interaction. There is that uh, non-interaction, but there are a lot of positive aspects and elements that come into it too. So I just want to stress that, and I won't go too much right now into what those, uh, what that entails, um, but I just like to make sure people understand that this disenchantment is not anhedonia, I think it is, I don't remember. Um, the idea that you're not taking pleasure in anything in the world, you don't get pleasure from anything. There's a sense of joy that comes about when you stop being pushed and pulled around by these hindrances. So if you experience disenchantment, then if you're practicing well, you may also experience dispassion. And dispassion is like, uh, kind of like disenchantment on steroids a little, but that's not really a great explanation. Um, dispassion is when you see the nature of the arising and passing away of uh, the passion that's driving these things these hindrances, let's say it's sensual craving or it's restlessness. Um, restlessness, if it comes up and passes away, is very easy to see it's arising and passing away because it is sometimes very quick. If you can uh, note that coming up, passing away, coming up, passing away, uh, see the impermanence of it and get less involved with it and less involved, Eventually, there's a time where you might just feel like you you just want to put it all down. You have a sense that it's exhausting to keep carrying this around. Uh, it's a sense of release. It's a sense of relaxation. It's a sense of uh, basically just not being caught up in and involved in it. Anymore. But it's it's almost an action. Uh, it's when the bonfire for that moment might go out or come close to it. Sometimes this is uh, really, really deep in meditation. It's, you know, your body might, your sensations of your body might have passed away and, you know, come and gone and experience different things in meditation, always coming back to the object. Um, but one thing that you can see with meditation and with, with practice is that there's a real sense of, of tension and stress that comes up when these hindrances are coming up and, and pushing on your idea of the meditation object that you're trying to strive to, to stay with. There's a, I would like to think of it, I've talked before about, it's like a uh, fault line. You know, if you have two fault lines pushing together, one of those things is reality. Reality is the hindrances coming up, and your desire for this meditation object is another one. Um, but part of that is that this is this present. You know, your present is this tension and this stress, the sense of force that's between these two things. Um, because you have craving and desire within your uh, meditation that causes this. If you don't have craving and desire in it, then you can basically choose your future. You can choose the breath. You stop pushing and messing with this hindrance. The hindrance doesn't come up as much, and then you're just left with the breath. So um, if you do that enough, and it becomes very natural feeling, Sometimes you just completely release all the control, completely release everything but the observation, the awareness, and that's when you can finally get to where these things don't affect you as much. Maybe you can experience some disenchantment or dispassion. No more struggle. So there are a couple of ways that people can practice. Um, one of those is 
uh, I think most people come to Buddhism with the idea that you're you're wanting to get some relief from suffering, from craving, just want to feel like you're happy sometimes. Uh, and that's a valid place to start, I feel like. Because ultimately, this there's more to it than that. But the goal is to relieve from suffering. Eventually, that becomes very complicated and people move on to uh, a deeper sense of the path. But Buddhism is a little bit like art. You know, I didn't quite understand art. My wife has done some art in the past and um, I've always been someone who didn't really understand it necessarily, which sounds really weird. Of course, there are forms of art like music that I do understand, but, but I guess like painting, sculpture, things like that. Um, but I came to understand this concept of music in that, you know, it can mean different things to different people. There's an intention from the original creator, the Buddha. He didn't create Buddhism, but he discovered this path and he brought it to us. And within that is our own understanding of it. So both of those things are valid, um, but you have to look at it and see what it means to you and what it means to you might change over time, just like if you listen to a song um, consecutively, a song that has a lot of deep meaning, maybe you can look at it 10 years later and it means a different thing to you. None of those might be exactly what the creator intended, but um, hopefully you can at least get an idea from this comparison that if you're not doing some of the things, you know, Buddhism talks a lot about um, very, very deep, complicated subjects. Um, doesn't have to be deep and complicated, but it becomes that way. People look at it that way. But if your practice is based on relieving suffering here and now by this method of sitting in meditation and allowing these hindrances to, to come up and pass away and you go back to your meditation object and you feel good and you feel happy, well, that's okay. Because eventually, I think that you would have the idea and the understanding if you're meditating correctly, that these are impermanent things coming up and passing away. And through that, you'll begin to understand the nature of your own mind nature of mental, mental phenomena and um, that's already into the deeper path so then you might say hmm, let's read more about that and you'll go and you'll read about it and, and see for yourself that it's true and that's what it's all about um, there's the second type of person i'd like to just bring up is somebody who is more interested in the deeper idea of what is this reality that's coming up and passing away. Maybe you've already seen that these, or understood at least, that these thoughts that are coming up, these feelings, this feeling, um, is all based in the sense of self. Self doesn't necessarily have any basis in reality. It's a concept that we're basically dreaming up. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist the way we think. So how to look at that? How do we understand that? How do we see that? I don't have all the answers to that question, but that's the deeper path where it's not necessarily just about happiness. It's about understanding reality as it as it really is, understanding the moment as it really is, because you've started to get an inkling that maybe this isn't quite what I think it is. Maybe it doesn't lead to happiness the way that I thought it did. You know, getting these material things and saving money, spending time with the people you love, these are great things, um, eating good food, that's all great, but it's all a part of the push-pull of reality, and we don't really have that much control over those things. They're just arising and passing away. And if they're going our way, we're really happy. If they're not going our way, we're really unhappy. So how do we get any kind of control? How do we get any kind of basis for understanding the world? The Buddha talks about this 
in a lot of different places. Everybody has to find their own sort of way through this to navigate this path. But um, one of the key concepts that the Buddha had is from, this is from Majjhima Nikaya 148, which I really love. It's the six sets of six. It dissects all of the, the pieces of what a person is and encourages the listener to understand this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. There were a lot of suttas that the Buddha would give or, or talk about. Uh, at the end of this one, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's quite long. As far as the reading, it probably take an hour, maybe more. Um, if I was to read it at the pace, I would. But at the end of this one, there were 60 people that were listening that achieved uh, some level of understanding of, of the world, um, became liberated from this. But you can practice this way. This is one way to practice the deeper path. To understand when, when these things arise, you know, your desires and, and craving, if we go to eat lunch and the lunch was not what we wanted or it is what we wanted, it doesn't matter because those ideas and concepts that are coming up, those are just a symptom of the belief in a permanent entity. And the Buddha is saying here that that specific thing that's coming up is not permanent. It's not based in uh, a real reality. It's a conditioned thing. It comes up, passes away. It doesn't have anything to do with you. And that's true for all of your um, thoughts and feelings and things like that. Probably that sounds a little crazy. Uh, sounds a little painful. I would think that too if I heard it. But the truth of it is that all we really have are the six senses, you know, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. That's all that really exists. Everything else is a little bit of a, um, a story that we're telling ourselves. And this sounds like it could be negative too. If we think about how this isn't a self, there isn't a self, is there a self, is there not? Uh, all of this is sort of getting wrapped up into an idea uh, that's unnecessary to really think about, but this specific practice doesn't bring unhappiness, just like that other one I was talking about. Um, disenchantment and dispassion. It's actually quite liberating if you can understand. Um, you take responsibility for the things that have come up, but it doesn't mean anything. It's just a part of an impersonal um, stimulus. So you can go back to what you're doing. It doesn't have to make you feel bad. It's actually quite a relief. I didn't really prepare a good ending to this talk, so I'll just end it there. Thank <laughs> you.